Okay, you guys, um, welcome to uh, the, this panel, which is about uh, how research is used for both fiction and nonfiction. Um, I think you guys all have bio sheets, but this is Tom Dija. Richard no, I'm Pan Tom Dija. Oh, that's right. Thank you. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm Tom, Tom Dija. Well, the real, yes. Tom okay, so I'm going to leave it up to you to figure out which one is Tom Dija, which one is Richard Panic, and which one is Patty McCormick. And I'm Susie Merrill. Um, I, I want to start out, I hope because I have the wrong glasses that I can read this. When I was asked to moderate this panel, I remembered a Writers on Writing from 2001. It was the novelist Gail Godwin writing a, about a nonfiction book that she was completing on the heart. And she said, the most, the most surprising difference was that the nonfiction book turned out to require less research than my novels. When I packed away my two years worth of research for Evensong, the papers filled two empty champagne cases. There were several pounds of data on military prisons in World War II photocopied out of print books on millennium phenomena, microfilm theses on orphanages in America, hefty rubber banded clumps of material on firefighting, lung damage, bell tower designs, and the ordination process for priests. I had also acquired a sizable theological library, whereas my two years of worth of research folders for heart won't fill a single champagne carton, and the books I needed to buy for the project were few. So. Um, I realized that in writing fiction, I overcompensate on research because I'm making up a whole world and have to convince myself I know where everything is and how characters got to be the way they are, even if I don't end up putting it in the novel. So what do you guys think of that? Does that jive with your experience? Or jive, whichever I one is. that much champagne. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was impressed by that. If it was red wine, I would have had the cartons. Um, well, I've, I've written both historical fiction and nonfiction. I know, think history. everyone here so, has that. Right. Yeah. So, yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I mean, I found that, um, you know, it, with history, uh, much of what or some of what you're working with has already been digested to a certain degree, mm -hmm. unless you really are researching some 17th century person who's never been written about or something like that. There's a lot of work usually done about whatever you're doing and you're looking for a new angle in it. And in fiction, I think you really are going deep and trying to create a world for your own mind. And then you have to translate that into something. And the real job among everything else about research, I think in fiction, is getting rid of most everything that you've researched and pick just the most salient telling details that in, in put them in your character's hands. Do not, you know, describing rooms of, on the top floor there was, I mean, all that kind of thing. The whole lesson is about what you throw out and it's gonna be 95% of what you've researched. What it's there for is to create the world for you in your mind so you can describe it and then the job so, of writing begins. So that you know what the salient detail is. Right, exactly. The, yeah, right, yeah. right. So can you give an example, say, from Play for a Kingdom? Um, the, well, it's, it's, it's funny, it's a detail I threw out. I mean, I, well, you know, there's so many details. And there was a, it was a novel about a series of baseball games between the North and South during the Civil War. So obviously there's almost infinite amount of things to research about both of these things in that period. And so I did a, a, a huge amount of, of research on the Civil War, kind of starting at the broadest, you know, and, and deciding that I wasn't, that I didn't, I wasn't gonna assume that I knew anything about the Civil War because I didn't, I wasn't a history student. And so I just went wide and then narrowed in there. And it ended up having a lot to do with the Battle of the Wilderness in Spotsylvania in 1864. And there's one detail that everyone talks about. It was a huge bloodbath, you know, but there were so many shots fired that a tree that was in the middle of the battlefield was shot down by, by bullets. All the bullets hit it and it fell in the middle of the battle. I, of course, did not include that detail in my book because every book I read about yeah. the battle had it in there. Mm -hmm. And so I said, you know, I would like to write the first book about Spotsylvania that doesn't <laughs> talk about this damn tree, right? So then I go out on tour and people say, do you know there was a tree? <laughs> so I realized I probably should have put the damn tree in there. But yeah, there usually is, for all these things, a, a tree. I'll give you another example. I, I've met um, Ron Howard optioned that, that book. And so I went to meet him and I loved Apollo 13. My, that is a movie, it just is a historical film. It just works for me. You know, there's this one moment when the guys are up there lost in space and they reach over for a slide rule. 
you know, and at that moment you realize, oh my God, they're up there with all the power of a toaster, you know, right. and, <laughs> and there's a guy with a slide rule figuring it out. And I said, you know, that I really love that detail it was so great. And he said, well, we kind of stuck that in there because they did have computers, but we thought that, that would be so. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. that is, in fact, historically inaccurate, and yeah. I don't recommend that. But that kind of detail, when true, um, <laughs> really is what you want. Something that really speaks to everything, the world that you have, without having to encumber them with you know certain kinds of shoes, certain kind of hats, certain kind of doors, certain kind of everything. Make it. Try to put as much as you can into a certain object or moment. Really, that depends on that historical item, you know, mm -hmm. or, or idea, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it has to be necessary in the moment. It has right. to arise out of the character. I mean, it can't, it can't just be the detail to make the scene come visually alive for the reader. It has to reinforce some underlying character thematic. Well, it speaks to the idea of your, of your characters living in time. Right. And if they really do live in that time and place, they're going to naturally be availing themselves of the things around them and their lives are going to be based on those things of that world. They're right. going to run from so that falling tree. Ex exactly. <laughs> so it's, it's, it, it will happen naturally if you've created, I think, a great enough, a rich enough sense of, of that world for yourself to then be able to make those decisions. Right, right. I wanted to go back to the, Gail, is it Gail Godwin? Yes, comment yes. About the security that research gives you. Um, I'm a former journalist, so it really helps me to, to have a scaffolding of facts on which to hang a narrative that I make up. And I don't think my imagination is that powerful, that I can create an entire world like some people do with um, science fiction and fantasy writing. But you're doing the equivalent of that with fiction, mm -hmm. even though you're using facts as your, uh, your, your foundation. Uh, one of the books I wrote is about a girl who self-injures. I don't self-injure. I'm way too much of a chicken <laughs> to ever have hurt myself that way. And in fact, I was fascinated by this impulse that you could have to want to hurt yourself as opposed to the natural impulse that we all have, which is to protect ourselves from harm. So I, I found all the research I could on the phenomenon of self-injury, which at that point was precious little. And uh, a very wise editor suggested to me that after I had all my research, that I put it away. And I actually gave it to a friend put it in a suitcase and said to her, don't let me have this no matter what. <laughs> if I call you at 2 in the morning, don't let me have it. Because, because I was a journalist, there was a danger that if I relied too heavily on the research, it would, the book would just become a giant magazine piece. Mm -hmm. So what made the, um, the magic happen is what these guys are talking about, that you bring your own imagination to the story and let it grow out of the character's experience. So even though I don't self-injure, I could remember what it felt like to be 13 and be so lonely or scared or voiceless or frustrated or whatever it is and, and apply that to the story and let that rise through the research. When I finished the book, it was already in galley form, I went to a facility for girls who self-injure and I was really terrified that they would see it and they'd say, you've got this all wrong. And in fact, the, the, what they said was, so you, so you cut yourself too. Mm -hmm. And to me, that was a real compliment. The highest right. yeah. compliment, right. yeah. Kind of. Yeah, in some yeah. weird, yeah. In some weird yeah. more. Yeah. But I think that point about scaffolding is, was certainly my first novel was very true, because I, like many you know, people who wanted to write fiction, had many starts and stops and kind of where do I go with this. And that idea of people who write I'm going to set up the characters and they're just going to go do fascinating things and I'll kind of record them as they go. You know, that to me is how you get, that's like writer's block one, you know. Right. And so, <laughs> you know, and I, that idea, I sit and look at the paper and, you know, until my eyes bleed kind of thought, you know. So what I was able to do by writing a novel that was going to take place within a certain period of time was I just researched the hell out of that period. And I had to be able to fit my characters and the scenes that I was going to create within that time period. So I created a big, you know, massive poster boards of, of the time frame of what was going on everywhere during these, these two weeks in, in the battle. And then I fit everything in there, but I always knew that when I woke up, I was going to have to be dealing with a kind of reality of what was going on. And it was a way for me to be able to 
enter into fiction without existing completely in this imaginary place mm -hmm. or with these characters who were just really not even cohered yet, having to answer to history and to reality was for me a really great way to, to start and to, you know, at this point I, I probably, if I was gonna write fiction again, um, I, I might not feel the same need for that. Um, I might want to just because I enjoy it or get something out of it, but it, it was a crutch at the beginning. It was a great way to kind of yeah. discipline myself and be able to move into my own voice with, with more I actually help. find as I mature as a writer, I need it more <laughs> rather than less. So maybe I need the crutch more, but that's maybe the know, crutch our, works for me. Our knees go, our hips go. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> the that's crutch right. is not a bad that's thing. Right. <laughs> so Richard, why don't you speak a little bit about the practical matters of how, like, how you research what, you know, what, what your methodology is, what's the, what's the, do you first start with the Google or the <laughs> Library of Congress or interviews or you get an idea or you get an assignment, where, how, what's your process, how do you store your material, how do you manage your material, you guys know what I'm yeah. asking. Yeah. Uh, well, I tend to write about things that I don't know anything about initially, and you know the um, the idea interests me, and then I kind of throw myself at it. So I really start from scratch. I just try to find out e through Google, the Google, the Google, <laughs> um, and and uh, before Google, I would just go to the library and and take out the most basic, rudimentary books. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I was asked to write a book about the telescope, I got out a book by Isaac Asimov about the history of the telescope, and I read it, and I thought. I don't like, I mean, it's just like fact, 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 and that's not interesting to me. I want there to be a narrative, I want there to be something. So, so I learned from it what I didn't want to do, but it also gave me the beginnings of that entryway into this world. And then you just kind of follow your nose, and you just keep researching and researching um, what interests you. And you kind of, um, at least I find that I have learned to trust myself so that as I follow my nose, I realize that I'm educating myself about the subject and that uh, um, that my learning process, I, I can perhaps convey it to, uh, to, the, to the reader through that same way, through following that same. So you're waiting for an order to impose itself, in essence. Right, and I also, um, I, I also often write about historical figures. By historical figures, I don't just mean Einstein, Freud, and Galileo, but I mean people who are alive, but who are, who are engaging in historically important uh, work. Uh, and, and I try, through my research, to understand their point of view. So um, I, I try to say, uh, if, for those of you who are at the craft lecture I gave the other day, I put these three questions on the board. So I try to understand from, and I treat them as characters. I think of them as characters. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, and you know, with dialogue and action and conflicts and so on. Uh, and I ask myself, well, what did they know at the time? What did they want to learn? Then what did, did they learn? And then what did they want to know? And it, when you break it down into, the, into those really basic questions, even very complicated and esoteric scientific material lays out very cleanly, mm -hmm. because what they're asking is usually uh, very clean. So then what do you do as you're aggregating and accumulating material? What do you physically do with it? I'm looking at my wife because <laughs> she has seen <coughs> she has seen the results of that. I don't I don't know how big a champagne case is, but I think I think two is is um, is it's like pff, laughable. It's like, it's like oh, you call that research? Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> so you yeah. you are not Gail Godwin then? Uh, no, it's like I I mean it's if if you were to you know I don't know it's it's it it took over my son's bedroom when he went to college. Wow. You know, it's yeah. like just, it overwhelmed it. Because there are books and there are passages in books and there are printouts and there are drafts and I print out many drafts and there are clippings from newspapers and uh, magazines and, and everything. Although there comes a point where I find in my research that I'll be reading, uh, let, let's say, a, a, a piece of scientific um, research and there'll be a footnote and I'll know what the footnote is referring to before I go to it, and that tells me now I'm now, now I'm there. now I'm in the material. Yeah. And the, um, do you remember the book uh, about 20 years ago? I guess called "What It Takes," by I think it was Robert Sam Anson. He it was it was about it was about the 1988 presidential yes. campaign, and he, he followed. Right. 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 Oh, thank you, Richard, Richard Ben Kramer. Yes, right. thank you. Um, and he 
uh, and he, he, he wrote about six of the candidates from the 88 presidential race. Uh, and he said, I heard, heard him in an interview saying that he realized that when he was playing back the tapes and he was hearing his own voice more than people was, he was interviewing, that he was done. <laughs> he knew too much. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Or when your family's eyes glaze over. Yeah. Uh, Richard Ben Kramer? Did I get that? Yes. yes. He did. Thank he you he died within the last year. <laughs> so, um, how about you? Oh, I was just going to um, pick up on what Richard said about following your nose, and that can mean anything. I mean, the, so much of the fun is the hunt. But you'll also then start to see it goes beyond library research. You're going to be watching movies. You're going to be collecting fabric. All kinds of fun, it, fun things. It should be fun, and anything counts. Right. And can I go all Luddite on you? Please do. But <laughs> I, think, you really, I think I'm with you. <laughs> you know, you can't trust anything you read online. Because when you do research, what you're going to discover is that you're going to find something, and you're going to read exactly the same paragraph plagiarized, because there is no other word for it, plagiarized in five different places, and you will not have any idea what the original one is. You will not be able to confirm anything in any of those five places because it's unconfirmable unless you can find something that actually is tangible and can be confirmed. So all of that world is useful in very, very specific ways. It can be useful in a way of digital archives. I mean, my last book was a, a cultural history of post-war Chicago. So it was about, you know, just 10 different things, architecture, Ray Kroc, Second City, you know, the Chess Brother, all these different things all over the place. And, and, and just it, won a, 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 an award, the Heartland. The Heartland, Heartland Prize. Award. Yes. But yes, um, for nonfiction. Um, so it was for all, you know, so it's all over the place. And, you know, so it, what I was able to find, what the point was, is that there are digital archives now, which are tremendous and very important. Yeah. Something like, you know, the Art Institute of Chicago has an oral history collection of all of Chicago architecture. Probably, you know, four feet of, of paper that I would have had to have gone to Chicago and spent months reading. It's available online. I could sit around in your at 3 a.m. when I'm busy sending rejection notes. You know, but, um, <laughs> You know, I could exactly read it in my jammies. I, I, I licensed, I leased for a year and a half the entire Chicago Tribune. Right. And I could just sit in whatever I needed. I could get the weather, whatever. I had that. You know, so those things are available now. And that's the great part of the internet. When you can really learn to access libraries and databases and use real primary stuff. But random crap on, inter on, on pages should be wadded up and, and taken ignored. with more than a grain of salt. It's yeah. just not real. Yeah. So I mean, I don't well, know if I, you've had. I, I, tell, I tell students, uh, and I, I know this from scientists too, that Wikipedia is like the first stop. But it's only a way to understand what are the parameters exactly. of, of right. the topic. And then right. you have to verify yeah, and verify and verify. You, can't, you yeah. cannot use so, that. So, I also, I want to tell a story from the summer conference two years ago I, when I had just started working here and I w had been working on this project about Shirley Jackson that started as a biography and then was a novel told in, in Shirley's voice and then was sort of morphing at that point into what it has ultimately become. And um, I was doing a mini workshop and somebody in the mini workshop, I happened to mention that I was working on a book about Jackson and somebody came up to me after the class and said, that's so weird. My husband was the best friend of their youngest child growing up. And um, I mean, and yeah. I then met, had dinner with them. I got, he had a nickname that Shirley Jackson called him Mealtime because he always showed up at dinner time. <laughs> and, and he's in the book now. I mean, and that was just, because I think part of research is not closing off. Part of research is saying, oh, well, this is what I'm doing. It's, you know, right. I'm totally obsessed right. with it. I love right. it. And whoever can give or take, you know, stuff just starts falling in your yeah. lap. I think you have to research with your left brain as much as your right, or your right brain as much as your left. If you, you know, know which one you, it is, right, that's exactly. good. <laughs> I mean, you have to be open to those wonderful moments of, of connection because that's what people want to read. That's the interesting stuff is when you come across things and go, wow, you know, and, and research not just in a, in a fact way, but to find those things that spark, you know, and I've yeah. had weird, um, I think the weirdest 
research thing I had was I was sitting reading the Tribune one night at 1 a.m. about the weekend that Nelson Algren and Simone de Beauvoir meet and they have this torrid love affair and I'm just reading the Chicago Tribune from 1947, what's the weather like, what's in the movies kind of thing and I scroll down and there's my father who had oh died when I was oh in God. college, you know, and a big picture of him and it's he's starring at Weber High School and Brother Orchid, you know, as, <laughs> as Fat Dutchie or something like that and, you know, I just burst into tears, you know, and I always come, you know, um, and it was just remarkable, you know, out That's of all incredible. the days out of 150 years of the Tribune, and there's my dad, you know. Um, wow. But things like that happen. And my, and you know, my first novel, I was uh, the the regiment I picked from the North was from Brooklyn, so I did all this research trying to find what would be the great, you know, the perfect baseball playing Brooklyn regiment. So I went to the Brooklyn Historical Society, which I don't even know if it's open anymore. Is it still in Jerome yeah, yes. Street? Fabulous big old thing, you know. And I'm reading all these papers, and there's nothing really. I walk out, I'm about to leave, and there on a counter is just a file that says Civil War. Right. Tom, Tom died to pick up this right, file. Exactly. It's like, <laughs> oops, sorry. And, the, and it has in it the adjutant's report of, of this regiment with everything they did in the entire war, including the scores of the baseball games that they had played. So it was just, you know, wow. So then I said, okay, those are my guys. Ooh. Yeah. And then I, I researched what's going to be the other regiment, the Southern regiment. So I find, like, in Alabama, and I find theirs, and I find their little regimental history. Southern ones are not as long. Um, so their first duty, it turned out, was to bury the dead of the Brooklyn 14th after the Battle of Gettysburg. Wow. So it, it, certain things, you know, and I would never plan that it just sort of fell into place. And things like that happen mm -hmm. if you research it, in a kind of creative way, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think the other thing, maybe you guys have encountered this too, there are all these experts out there who are dying to share yeah. that minutia or that expertise that they have. Um, when I started researching the book about child trafficking, it was a long time ago, actually, and it wasn't as well known as it is now. But as you said, I started telling people, I'm working on this book about trafficking where girls are actually sold, blah, blah, blah. And I met one person who said, I, I have a friend who's involved. And she connected me with the next one. And it's like this bucket brigade of people who take you where you need to go. And the next thing I knew, I had a plane ticket and I was on my way to Kathmandu. Yeah. No, and, and, it is this, and it is the same thing that um, happens in the writing process, in the researching process, there's this moment where you kind of light up and you say, oh, I, I, see, I, see, why, I see why I'm here. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 So how do you decide the form, the genre? How do you decide what you're, whether it's a novel or nonfiction or, and I mean, what comes first, the idea or the form or the I want to? I, I haven't written historical fiction, so I can't. Yeah. I, I mean, well. It, I think that um, some of it for me was the marketplace, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, I, I for me, f nonfiction has become a more, uh, I, I think it's working better for me than yeah. fiction, you know, <laughs> right. in a certain way. That's, right. uh, that's kind of empirical. Um, but, <laughs> you know, there are stories <laughs> that can be told better in, um, in, in Nonfiction than in fiction. Certainly, history. You know, you can't do a fictional history. You know, unless you're Umberto Eco or something like that. I was going to say, you certainly right. can. Right. You know, right. But it's in people. Take that but, back. I mean, I think that one, in picking which one you're going to do, something like the book that Suzanne, my wife, was talking about before, the Shaker book. Right. You know, that clearly is a book about a world. Right. You know, if there's a place in the past or a moment or a community or an event in the past that you'd like to write about, but maybe there isn't a great all right, here's an example. Sorry, and, uh, mm -hmm. I finally no, no. realized what it was. I was thinking about maybe doing a book about the Chicago fire. No, there hasn't been a really good no, kind of narrative, narrative nonfiction recent. It's been decades, decades, decades. So I really, I did a lot of research on that. And there are, um, there are letters and stuff, but they're only from the wealthy. Mm -hmm. So I thought, you know, for me to do the, the nonfiction book I want to do, which would be an entire kind of 360, what's the experience of this for everyone, right. I would have been very hard pressed to be able to do that in nonfiction. Right. It would be a lot easier for a novel because you can make all that stuff up. Right. You know, you right. can fill in those holes that the record doesn't really have 
I, so if I was going to do a book on the Chicago Fire at this point, I, I think fiction is better just right. because you can make that stuff up. And yeah. for me, the nonfiction, a real history of the sort I would have done, would have, for me, lacked. Right. And I think it might be one of the reasons why that book hasn't been written, because <laughs> there is no record of half of the experience of the fire. Right. So that, to me, was determined by the research and what existed as to what I think the better choice is. And it is, you know, not many people, I think, do both at the same time. I think it's a real challenge. And mm -hmm. it's hard to think of people who are writing serious, you know, they are great minds among us, you know, who can do, this, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's hard. I mean, how do you decide? Well, most of my books are fiction. Well, they all are, actually. But the last one could have been nonfiction. Yeah. And I really took that as a challenge. Like, maybe I could write a, a serious book of nonfiction out of a first person account. When I tried to do that, it flattened the narrative. It sounded like Walter Cronkite was narrating the book. It didn't have any liveliness. Not no diss on Walter, but. Uh, so when I decided to switch it to fiction, it gave me so much latitude. Suddenly the voice of the narrator, which was this 11-year-old boy, came into my head and he was the obvious choice to tell the story and then that allowed us to really play with language in particular, his you know, non-standard English. The other thing is because it's an oral history of somebody who survived uh, a series of traumatic experiences, there are aspects of his memory that are razor sharp. There are aspects of his memory that are kind of threadbare and worn because he's told them so many times. And then there are other aspects that he can't remember at all. So we were able to bridge that gap with fiction. So for instance, so many children stepped on landmines. It's not something he could say, yes, there was a little girl who stepped on a landmine and she was my friend and it was really traumatic. He just said it happened all the time. He could tell you what the click of the, of the spring being sprung sounded like. He could tell you what gangrene looks like and what it smells like. But to make that have impact, you need to have it happen to a particular person. Right. So I created a little girl, let's say on page 63, who's based on um, research. There were girls who carried rice for the platoons. So she's carrying the rice. They become friends, They're, she's on 63, they become friends on page 92. Something else happens to bond them more tightly on page 118, so that when she steps on the landmine on <coughs> 142, you, you really care. Right. And fiction allowed me to do that. Right. 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 Yeah. So, so <laughs> <laughs> hello. Um. There's a simple answer to this. You know, you, the question. I, well, the question is like how, if you have certain, uh, you know, and a prejudices, which I use in a broad, you know, historical position maybe, what do you do with a fact or it, it, something that happens that doesn't really jibe with what you're putting, what you want to say or your worldview? And I think the answer is simple. Either you have integrity or you don't. Either you have integrity or you don't as a writer. I mean, if you, if you want to twist history or ignore or pretend it didn't exist in order to serve your position, you certainly have the right to do it, but I think it undermines you as, as a credible writer. I mean, that's just me. You Either it's there and you deal with it, or you're not. 
you know, so I, I... But if you deal with it, it can also deepen, it can also make the, the themes more complex. Of course, yeah. no, I think you should, I mean, I'm saying you can't yeah. right away, right. you can't pretend things didn't right, happen. Right, right, but I'm, I'm saying that it's not necessarily um, a disadvantage if you come across a counter-narrative. Exactly. Yeah. No, I mean, right. but I also think as a writer, I, you know, and that's one of the differences with fiction and nonfiction, I think, is that with fiction, you do get to fart around. The, you know, Harry, what's his name, who writes these alternative histories where, yay, the South wins, you know, all that kind of stuff. You can do that. <laughs> if you're writing fiction, you can come up with any kind of stuff you want to do. You can make Anderson right. dis Andersonville disappear. But if you're writing nonfiction and you, you know, you, you got to, you got to deal with it. You know, you don't have a choice, otherwise you're not writing nonfiction. So. Mm -hmm. See, though, my question relates to the distinction between fiction and nonfiction. You're writing a story about, uh, you know, some guy who's strictly out of your mind and somehow Andersonville comes up. Aren't you obligated, even though the, the story is fictional, aren't you obligated when you bring up an historic episode that's so well documented Aren't you obligated to have a certain reportorial honesty about that one episode? You cannot be totally uh, fictional about things that are are known. Well, you, it seems to me. I, I mean, I, I, well, it depends because if you're working with fiction, your characters see things and you are limited by what your characters know right. and see. If you're dealing with nonfiction, you have an obligation to be covering the truth in a, in a clear and a and somewhat objective way but you're also but your your character your characters might know or your characters might you're limited by that but yeah. you're also people know these things happen so if you have right. a character who gee is living in Poland is working in a small village during world war 2 and doesn't yeah. see Auschwitz you know yeah. but every reader <laughs> seems to know about it you know yes. i think then you have to deal with the reverb of what your characters There's, yes what they see don't something. see but what the reader knows happens. So I mean, it's a, it's a real point, but fiction does, I think, unfetter the, the author, you know, and some people, I think, abuse that opportunity to pretend things away, but I do think that serious, credible fiction in some way does have to come to terms with it, and I think Susie's point about relying on your characters to provide that. I mean, the last thing on a craft level you want to do is suddenly, you know, take three pages to describe Andersonville. You need to put somebody in there if you really want to talk about it. You need to make us see it through your character's experience, I think. I'm just thinking of, the, I, I can't remember who it is, the little novel, A Prayer for the Dying, about the doctor with, in the town with, um, in 1918. Anybody? No. No. Damn. Google. But, but yeah, quick, Google. quick, somebody Google that. Google, Google, please. Right. Yeah, use the Google. That one you can do it for. Right. But in any case, I mean, that's very limited by what the narrator sees and his experience of, of an evolving understanding of what they're in, you know. Stuart O'Nan. Stuart O'Nan. Yes, that's it. <laughs> Stuart O'Nan. Well done. Yeah. So, um, you know, you do, get, you do get an advantage with fiction, I think. Um, so a question I have for you guys is, uh, do you, uh, you have all this research and you're using what you uh, have to do the particular project that you've embarked on and then do you um, remarket the other bits? I mean, I know I sometimes write nonfiction things about Jackson because I know things I can't use and I just want people to know about them. You mean like articles? Articles or op-ed. Yeah, yeah, I mean, just yeah. so you so you stay talk a little bit about the other things you do with your research outside the um, the actual project. Well, I have giant files called leftovers, yeah. <laughs> and I hope lives in those files that somehow that's going to have the, that material is going to have right. a life outside my champagne cartons, <laughs> <laughs> but rarely does it. Mm -hmm. And oh, I, really, yeah, for me, anyhow. I feel like, yes, in a certain way, I have expertise now on trafficking or on um, the world of the Khmer Rouge. And every so often when something happens in the news, I will write an op-ed to try to, f to funnel my thoughts mm -hmm. and feelings into something that I can repurpose. Mm -hmm. But I haven't had you know, good success. And I don't think I'm really built anymore for being out there and trying to um, 
work the magazine world the way I used to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I try to, I, I mean, I, I have, I'll put it into a blog or I'll put it into articles. Yeah. Um, some of the material gets re reused from, I mean, if it makes a particular point and I'm writing about a related issue, but I still have this, you know, this, this piece of information that I've already used in the book. I mean, it's, I think it's legitimate to use that information again. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I mean, so there's a lot of... Um, yeah, yeah. I think the other point, you know, I, I handed in a manuscript that was probably 200 pages mm -hmm. longer than what eventually got published. Yeah, yeah. So there's all kinds of things that got taken out of there. You know, one has that impulse to put all that you learned in the book. Mm -hmm. And often, usually, almost always, that's not what the final book is going right. to be. Right. Um, and some of that's just explaining the process to yourself almost because your readers would die. So. I'm finding that I, I'm out of those pages that I pulled out. I'm, I'm starting to like use it for lectures and things like that because right. usually yeah. it's things that you just go too deeply on within the context of what you're trying to talk about. Right. And so it, 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 it that's the good part of working with an editor who just flenses your book because a lot of that what stuff that is flens when they cut the fat off of whales. That's <laughs> flensing. <laughs> That's um, your word for the day. Flensing. <laughs> so I think of it as flensing the book, you know, and and so it, a lot of that, I will keep some of that stuff, or at least remember those people or places, just because they are sometimes usable. And I think that's when you write big fat books of history, that's probably right. more germane than some of these other things, which are right. tighter, you know. Right, right. It's funny. I I I've had trouble. Um, I became so obsessed with Jackson that I had trouble getting. I had I had to purge other pieces of things that I knew because nobody knew them and I felt I, I felt I had to share them and they didn't fit in the book so I had to do these other things I mean it was just the project wouldn't have been complete if I hadn't addressed their l early love letters which had no room in my book right. you know and stuff like that you just had to and so I don't know I just I had to get it out. I had to get it out. So um, I, I said to you guys last night, you know, and uh, I, I see myself as an id writer. I'm a, I'm a writer who is kind of flailing around in the dark and, uh, and really writing from a very emotional and unlike what you're saying, Patty, really writing from maybe a slightly lunatic place. And facts actually ground me. I use facts to, um, to limit m the sort of out of control nature of my Im imaginative process or whatever, and I suspect that in the world, so there, so facts are my super ego. They, you know, they keep me under control, or maybe they're, you know. So, and I was wondering, do, 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 how do you guys feel about facts? You like them, don't you? Yeah, they're, they're them. useful yeah. <laughs> when you're writing nonfiction. Pretty yeah. good. Yeah, they're pretty good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, what, what do you mean, how do we feel about facts? I mean, how, how, like, in the creative process, are facts your main place or your, so oh, for me, they're really, they're really the, the limitations. They, yeah. they keep me mm -hmm. from going off the rails. And no, I don't they're more of a, they're more of a spark for me. It's probably the opposite. Mm -hmm. it's, it sounds like it's the opposite of what you're talking about. Yeah. Where I'll, I'll follow the, the facts, as I said earlier, because I'm trying to understand from a character's point of view, even if the, char the character is a real person. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm just trying to understand the facts and see, you know, from inside their minds, what did the facts mean? Mm -hmm. And I'll try to get more facts out of them. This goes back actually to something I think that you were saying earlier about uh, when, you, when you're, if you're interviewing somebody, or I guess if you're, even if you're doing research, you're reading something, and you come up against the familiar material that they have told so many times that they can't tell anymore, or the tree, you know, mm -hmm. the tree that the falls obvious. Down. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that I, I find it's it's useful to like push people a little bit more. And I've done this sometimes mm -hmm. where I'll where I'll say, we all know this anecdote. It's like right. you know, and I'll even and they will even after that will begin to tell the anecdote again mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they think that that's what you want to hear. Even even if you're saying, I know the anecdote backwards and forwards, they'll still, t <laughs> right. they'll still tell you the anecdote. Right. Right. And, and there was an anecdote that I wanted to open my, my last book with in chapter one, but it's a familiar one if you know the subject well enough. 
So I wanted there to be a new detail in there, and I really pushed the person I was interviewing, and he finally gave me a couple of details. And I thought, okay, good. So for the reader who cares, the reader who knows the material, they will now be able to go to the end notes and see that the first paragraph comes out of interview. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> not the many, many times. Right, 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 right. right. Yeah, great. So do you guys have questions? My, my question is about what is universal knowledge? So in your book, everybody knows who Freud is. Oh, shit. OK. <laughs> everybody knows who Freud is. Everybody knows who Einstein is. And if they don't, they wouldn't admit it. But what if you're, you know, you're not writing about famous people? You're writing nonfiction, but the people you're writing about aren't famous. Nobody knows them. Nobody knows their history, or their history is really complicated. And then people in your writing workshop say, well, you know, don't waste our time with all this description. How do you bridge the gap? Are you writing fiction or nonfiction? Narrative nonfiction, your wife taught me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, Don't that's, say creative nonfiction. I'm not. I've never uh, okay. um, You know, that's part of what your job is. That's the meat, that's like saying, I, as I'm making dinner, I don't know how to deal with the meat and potatoes. You know, I mean, that, that's what the task of what you're doing is, is to tell us who these people are in a really fascinating, interesting way. I mean, the person I, and this is, I, what the, one of the people who really was my inspiration in going towards writing nonfiction was Lytton Strachey, like eminent Victorians, who takes people probably, you know, and just is able to write about people in, deliver these one or two sentences that just like, wow, got them, you know? I mean, that's the joy of this. That's the fun of it, is being able to really put your writing to a place where you can describe someone with those couple of brush strokes. I mean, that's, that is the artistry of it. So figuring out how to create these people in the reader's minds, that's, that's it, you know? I mean, it, that's part of it. It's not the whole thing, but that's very much to the core of what narrative nonfiction is, is rather than a regular his, you know, history, which might be a kind of accumulation of facts or a description, you know, A to Z kind of thing, you have the freedom in narrative nonfiction to present those facts in a creative, if, you know, fun to read way that, that really brings them to life. And so I wouldn't run from that. I, I think you have to embrace that, but not see it as work or like, you know, that, that is the fun work of what it is, creating great, what Richard says, characters. Think of them in those terms yeah. and describe them using what's real and what you know and have understood about them, your ability to describe them in a way that a fiction reader would enjoy as much as an academic or historian. Yeah, I don't think it matters if they're famous or right. you never heard of that, they're characters, and you just have to invest them with, with reality and conflicts and all the other things that go into fiction, except you're writing nonfiction, you're using um, facts, right. as, you would, as you would call them. Facts. Facts. But you know, when, oh, you no, go facts. Out, when you go out and interview people, when you research, you know, and, and, you, and you really dive into kind of the historical record on whatever it is, you really do see that, you know, in this room, if you were to sit down and interview all these people, they'd be really fascinating people. Not all of you, you know, but no, but they're like, no, no, but there's a lot. I mean, there'd be stories, there'd be things, you know, and mm -hmm. and describing that is is no different than describing a famous person in a way, you know. I mean, it is so you're creating those characters, as as Richard says, you know, and that's that. And the fact that they are well known or something or not well known isn't really the point, you know. It is just creating and writing about a person, and it's almost always going to be interesting. At least that's your job as a writer is to make someone who is shucking oysters for 42 years down to Shinnecock and sell cigarettes, like, make that no, fun. Don't give that you know, away. It's not, all right, you know, but that's, I mean, that's, that is what you do. And, and right. that's, that's to make anybody want to read it. And, and it the, doesn't matter if the person's famous. I mean, there are certain things that you can assume that people know. But uh, you mentioned Freud. Uh, what I did in that book, what was interesting to me is what he did not just during the psychoanalytic period, but before that, where he was, he was, you know, hardcore scientist. He was a neurologist. He he knew neurobiology. He created, uh, you know, I found out through my research that he created uh, new staining methods for using the microscope on cellular structures. And he was trying to figure out how the brain works. People don't generally know that. That part of history is pretty much put aside. But that's really interesting to me because you could see. You know, I've talked in terms of conflict and character and conflict that he's trying to solve a problem. 
He's saying, how does the brain work? Can I follow a thought, eventually, he's saying, through this process, through where synapses. And the synapse, uh, the idea of the synapse is very new. It's 1890. And he's like, he's going, oh, so I've been doing this research for 20 years, and now I can maybe, now that we know about the synapse, now I can really trace how thoughts work. And then when he comes up against that, and he can't do it, he writes 100 pages of this treatise that explains how it works. And at the end, he's defeated. That's when he goes into the unconscious. And, and that's what's interesting, right. is the defeat yeah. and the right. response to right. it. Right. And also, see, that was not a, a data dump. You know, this is what he did. And, but this is a story about how this happens. So it's a, you're in a story. You're not just saying, blah, blah, blah. You right. know, you're right. in a story. You are following somebody's yearnings and and desires and growing knowledge and you're with them. So that, it may be that you need all that information but you don't need it, you know, here's everything about them, you need the why of it, you need the character of it. So that even when you get to the, the so-called familiar material, the stuff we all know about Freud, it's now colored differently because now you understand that it came from right. this. Right, this and now early. Sitting, now and you're that's sitting there saying, I wish I had not asked this question <laughs> right. But that's people. crucially important with narrative nonfiction, because that is, what he's described, that's narrative nonfiction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, that's the whole point of it. It's creating that arc. It's creating, it's, it's finding the drama, not creating the drama, because then that's fiction. But mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's kind of uncovering it and presenting it and creating the cause for it and the case for it in a, you know, in a narrative and dramatic fashion. And I write for young adults, and so the universal knowledge base there right. is smaller. And I'm sort of the tour guide to whatever subject it is that I'm writing about. Luckily, in the work that I do, and I think this is probably the case in nonfiction work as well, well, for young adult characters, there's a bewilderment as they learn new things. There's that sense of confusion and discovery so that that character is learning alongside the reader who might have just incrementally more knowledge. Uh, and then of course there's the context that you can uh, apply around that discovery and just slipping it in oh so gently so again it doesn't feel like a data dump. Anybody else willing to, <laughs> to have 17 answers to your question? <laughs> <laughs> Um, when, when dealing with fiction in which you have facts, like for, well, for example, the, the Civil War baseball players, so you have all the win-loss records, or, or the scores, right, right. When, when writing fiction, if you need the scores to be different, or you need the South to have won more games than the North or something, can you change those facts to fit the story, or do you need to then change the story to fit the facts? No, I, I did not. I mean, and there are places where, you know, sometimes you do have to bend the metal in order to make certain things happen. But in the case of that, um, I, I saw myself as filling in the kind of openings in history. You know, I didn't really, there was no need for me to change anything salient about what I had learned about those regiments outside of creating this completely improbable thing right in the middle of it, you know. So, and it all fit that. And, I mean, I, I really do, in my fiction, tried extremely hard not to do that. I mean, I, I really, really, and I think you can probably, I mean, you don't, like I said, you know, move their little bits and pieces on the edges that I've sanded away occasionally, but really in a minor, minor, minor fashion, but never in any kind of major way. Because, you know, I'll be honest, and maybe you, when I was doing more fiction, it was kind of like a puzzle. Mm -hmm. I mean, part of the fun is trying to make it work that way. And when, if you can just say, oh, well, you know, let's be done with 1941, anybody can. Then, then you're just using power tools, and it's not the same thing, you know. And for me, part of the excitement is saying, you know, pop, it worked, you know, and, and getting it in there. I think it sort of goes back to your comment about how do we feel about facts. Right. They can be uh, confining you get this kind of yucky feeling in your stomach. You know when you're trying to make it be what you wish were true versus what was right, true. Right. You get that, it shows up in your writing, things get tight, you feel that you're starting to force a square peg into a round hole. But what that ends up leading to usually is um, 
higher heights of creativity. If you have to work around a constraint, mm -hmm. what do you do to make the story really sing within that constraint? Or are you working so hard, are you looking so deeply here and so stuck on this fact that you wish weren't true that you didn't notice that there's some amazing anecdote over here off to the side that could work into your story better? So I feel about facts like they're, they're kind of friendly constraints in some, in some right. ways. I agree. Right. I, though I, I will say I have done one thing that I feel still a little funny about, which is Shirley Jackson lived in two houses in North Bennington and I like one of them more than the other one, and so I chose to put her in the house mm. I liked. Mm. And I still sort of feel guilty about mm. it, but of course it's not the real house and it's not the real Shirley because of what happens in the book, but I chose the house that was nearer campus because I needed her to be able to go there and back. So I cut a mile off of her walk. She was a big woman, and I cut a mile off her walk. Okay. She appreciates it. <laughs> yeah, but I still sometimes From feel above. a little bit like, oh, that's the only bad thing I did, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I think if that's what they hit you on in, in yeah. a review, that's probably OK. I yeah, will I say. Think oh, I will it. say that fear of being fact-checked. Yeah. Yes, oh boy, that's, oh, a, that's a great, it's that's big. a motivator. Yeah. Forces, <laughs> yes, you, that's, that's yes. true, yes. forces you to do but, your very best well, work, yeah. though. With yeah. the Civil War people, the first thing, and this is when Amazon was young, and you know, <laughs> somebody wrote it, and the first thing on there, this book gets it all wrong. The epaulets on a lieutenant's colonel <laughs> is not <laughs> me. You know? yeah. So, you know, yeah, that's, especially if you're going to be, you definitely can't do that in a lot of places because you will get caught out. And, you know, like anything else, if you get a salad and there's a couple pieces of sand in it, you tend to think, ugh. Rather, you don't just flick the sand out. You say, ugh, the salad sucks. And so people feel the same about your book. If they say, oh, that's wrong, then suddenly the whole thing has been sullied to some degree or another. So you really do, it's not just prissiness. It, it, it is yeah. the work of it, I think. Yeah, I'm, I'm reading a nonfiction book now, and I noticed early in the first, uh, first or second chapter that it got a couple of the dates wrong, but it was like the, the author was trying to make a point about a cultural moment, yeah. but, but pushed things in 1967 to 1966. No. <laughs> I don't want to name names, but, <laughs> but, but it's, like, it's like, okay, so the book will be useful to me for other things but Maybe, it won't but because you have sand in your salad yeah yeah, yeah. But it, it but undermines the confidence yeah, exactly you, you never yeah, really absolutely. know yeah. melinda um i have a question about how um i'm concerned about how when you immerse yourself in a world to create it whether it's fiction or non-fiction <laughs> is there a legal responsibility or a convention or an obligation you have or, or just a courtesy to acknowledge the sources from which you've gathered your information? Good, big question. I mean, in fiction is a different beast. You know, fiction is, I think if you're writing something that is really big and you've done a vast amount of research, it can be interesting to do it, and some of the other publishing professionals can speak to that, to talk about if you've used some interesting original letters from someone or something like that, that can kind of help, I think, create a framework and something extra for it. Nonfiction, it is a whole other beast. I mean, there are, and there are panels and entire symposiums about this kind of stuff that you do have to, um, you know, credit things and give certain copyright issues with that. A narrative nonfiction, you do, one of the drawbacks of that whole world is the kind of creation of a gray area there. You know, and where people, just because you're writing the facts in an interesting, colorful, reader-friendly way, I don't think dismisses the, ne the necessity of having footnotes or crediting sources and things like that. Um, I think you still have to do that. I mean, my book has 150 pages of back matter, and, you know, I'm glad of it. Show off. I'm really <laughs> But you know, I got called out in a review for I have a scene where somebody brings in a big political moment, and the reviewer said, you know, and, and you know, how do we know what that what kind of flowers are in the room? Like I made it up, and the fact is, I have a I have a newspaper article where a union guy brings in the flowers. 
that's why I used it because <laughs> I knew I had it. You know, so yeah. and, and that and I got it in a footnote. You know, so I, I think that kind of narrative nonfiction, it, you can you don't have to have numbers over it, but it's very. I, I think it helps give the reader a sense of what we're talking about, of believing in what you're saying if you do produce that stuff at the end. And you know, it can be somewhat variable how you create your footnotes if you're out of an academic setting is a, is a, it's somewhat malleable, you know, on what you footnote and what you don't, and it's not like every other word, it's ideas, direct lifts, things like that. But it, it's definitely worth considering how you do it. In fiction, I think you have more room, and depending on the book, um, is how you present it. But you're certainly not going to footnote a novel. I mean, so what do you do? Yeah, what do you with your? Uh, I use endnotes, where where you have the page numbers and then a key phrase. Yeah, that's right. You know, mm -hmm. colon, key phrase colon, and then um, a reference to something that's in the bibliography. Right. Yeah. Right. Or interview. You know, mm -hmm. if, if that's what. Right. Yeah, I put endnotes in about uh, my methodology, or maybe an epilogue or an author's note or something like that, because I don't want to break the narrative for you to stop and go back no. and look right. yeah. at a footnote. I'd like there to be some sense of, I wonder how she did this, but right. I'm going to wait till I get to the end to find out. Right. Yeah. Right. Great. Anybody else? Other questions? So history, I guess they say it's kind of like fiction. We don't actually know what the two accounts are. There's so many contradicting accounts. Do you ever find yourself going shopping for the account that works best for your story? Hmm. Well, I'm not going to admit it. <laughs> <laughs> um, Is this thing on? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, I, I don't mean, think look, it, it's not yeah. always that way. You know, I mean, it, it, history is, is not fiction fundamentally. I think it's interesting what you do see when you research and you read all kinds of different accounts of things is that what I f came out of over the years seeing is that history is not a monolithic thing, that it really is it's stories that we create out of it, you know, and, and how it's told. And it opened up the world of history to me so that we can offer all kinds of different angles on it, but it's not this kind of description of the same path over and over. It could go all kinds of ways, and the way we tell it is, is almost happen chance at some point. But, you know, you do want everything that you want. But I do think that part of the reason why you write history is to get it right, and, and to really, and, and to get what is the real thing, and to go into it with preconceptions um, is a little, you know, you, you've kind of entered into a deal with maybe, I want to say bad faith, but it, when you're arguing a point, you got to deal with the stuff that is your point. And arguing a point and telling a history is, I think, complicated. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I think that the honest answer is yes. Once you have a theory about what happened, you do look for more uh, material that supports that view. But inevitably, you're going to come across that counter narrative and you've got to take that into consideration and again I think it goes back to what we were talking about earlier it forces you to write better stronger more creatively when you bump up against the stuff that you don't like uh, in, in uh, the book I wrote dealing with the discovery of dark energy there were two teams that were racing to discover something and it turned out to be dark energy but they thought they were actually racing to discover something else and they both arrived at the answer around the same time, but there was a lot of contentiousness because everybody knew that a Nobel was at stake. And in fact, they won the Nobel Prize in 2011. Um, but for those, <clears throat> after uh, the discovery was in 1998, so for those intervening 13 years, there was a lot of crossfire between the two teams. And there was even at the time when they were making the discoveries. And I was out with a friend, a journalist friend, when I started writing the book, and I said, these, these guys are telling these two different narratives. I mean, you've got, you've got one team saying this, you've got another team saying this, and they, and they can each marshal all the facts on their side. 
and you listen to them and you go, I'm absolutely convinced. And then you listen to the other side and you say, I'm absolutely convinced. And I said, I don't know what I'm going to do. I can't decide. And he said, it's not your job to decide. I said, oh, of course. It's my <laughs> job to present alternating points of view. Right. Right. You know, so that's, right. that's, that was the solution. And that goes back, again, to the idea of characters, that you're like telling the story from that person's right. or that group's But you do have a responsibility to kind of vet the story, oh, yeah, yeah. you know, I mean, yeah. someone, oh, yeah. you know, Holocaust denier, you know, yeah. I don't, you don't necessarily, you don't have to say, well, and then there's this opinion. I mean, if someone presents <laughs> it, a contrary <laughs> view that's completely off the grid, you know, if you do your due diligence and say, well, no, that, that's, they've got their own agenda. I don't think you have any responsibility no, to no. address that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But obviously there are, he said, she said, it said moments in history that, um, and that's the good stuff. I mean, I think when you learn to embrace that nausea of unknowing that you're, you know, you're kind of like <laughs> yes. these yeah. moments where you're like, oh, what yeah. am I going to do? And right. I, I, for me, I finally got to a moment where I said, okay, all right, this means I'm on to something. Yeah. You know, this means I've found the knot in the muscle and I just have to work it out and figure out what it is. And that, again, is the work of it. If it's all easy, you're not doing anything. It's the resolution of those knots that makes the book the book, I think, at the end of the day. I actually have a question that uh, dovetails that. And how do you go back to a friendly source and challenge him or her uh, after you've built a relationship and you need to go deeper or you need to penetrate those contradictions? I save it for very late in the process if I know <laughs> that's going to be coming up. Yeah, because you don't know if the person's then going to turn on you. And uh, and I, I had this in, in this in this book where uh, I had to ask two people difficult questions about the same issue. And I asked one person, he, and he was very evasive and, and kind of averted his eyes and said, well, I was young then and I really had to defer to my superior. So then I went to the superior and asked him. And I expected him to deny it some way, but he, he just kind of went, went, well, could I have handled it better, I suppose? And I thought, <laughs> that's an admission, you know, because I have other sources saying that it happened. But now he's not denying it, and that's as close to an admission as you're going to get out of this. But it was like one of the last, very last questions I asked him. Have you had that experience? I try to write about the dead. <laughs> <laughs> that's helpful, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I want to avoid that kind of work. But yeah, I would save it for the end. Um, just well, in that, did, in that did you have anything like that with Hugh Hefner? I mean, because there are some people still alive from your book. Yeah, I mean, I interviewed him. No, I know, but, did, yeah, but, but was there anything difficult that you had to ask him? No, I mean, I think that I, I like is he there, a virgin? There aren't many. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I think I approached as much as it. Also, I think you know, buy him drinks. No, but they <laughs> get him a little liquored up. But you know, I didn't really walk into these things thinking I was going to be having lasting relationships with them. Right. I think the first. I mean, ironically, the first person I interviewed, I did end up becoming friends with, but. Um, you know, 99% of them you're not. You're going in, there's that Janet Malcolm quote about journalists being basically, what is it, not unethical, but it's yeah, a, something, something like, that. like that. Basically you're doing something. So you are trying to get this information out of them and ultimately mm, the hell with them because you need to do it because that's what you have to do. And so you are going to end up burning bridges somewhere along the way and everybody might not like what you say about them and you have to be willing to do that. and be honest. I mean, that's why integrity and your honesty, that's kind of, if, if you have that on the table, people can say what they want, but you'll know that you've done that, you know? And if you've compromised yourself in various ways along the way, those kinds of, of questions and relationships become more problematic and I think compromise you. Mm -hmm. we question more? Good? We're good? Anything Looks like else? we're good. Anything else? No? Okay. Thank okay. you guys Thank so you. much. Thank you.